Good afternoon, and I'm delighted to welcome you to this webinar um, this afternoon. My name is Alex White, and I'm honoured to have been asked uh, to chair and to moderate uh, this session. It's part of the 2021 lecture series entitled Rethink Energy, Countdown to COP26, brought to you by the ESB and the IIEA. Um, throughout the course of this series, um, we're convening international thought leaders, uh, renowned energy experts and political leaders who will address critical issues in uh, energy policy in advance of the next annual UN Climate Change Conference, the critically important conference coming up uh, in Glasgow COP26 this November uh, 2021. So just at the outset, on behalf of the IIEA, I'd like to uh, welcome you and especially to thank the ESB for their sponsorship and their continuing sponsorship and support uh, for this series. Uh, this afternoon, we're delighted to be joined by two major figures of the European and the US um, electricity industry uh, who will reflect on the transition to a clean electricity future. And I mentioned the ESB, and I'm delighted that one of our two speakers, um, well known to you, um, is Pat O'Doherty, Chief Executive of the ESB, um, I'm going to say more about Pat in a few minutes when I call upon him to address us, but we're delighted to have Pat O'Doherty as one of our two speakers. Our other speaker, Thomas R. Kuhn, is president of the Edison Electric Institute, the association that represents all U.S. investor-owned electric companies. Um, EEI's members provide electricity, believe it or not, for 220 million Americans. They operate in all 50 states of the United States and the District of Columbia. They directly employ more than 500,000 workers across the US. In addition, EEI has 70 international electric companies as international members and 270 industry suppliers and related organizations as uh, associate members. Prior to joining the EEI in 1985, Mr. Kuhn was president of the American Nuclear Energy Council. He has served on the uh, uh, Energy Secretary's Advisory Board and on the board of the US Chamber of Commerce. So we are really, really delighted and honored to have you, Thomas, with us this afternoon. And I'm just going to invite you now by way of introduction to our session uh, to address us and to make some opening remarks. It's all yours. Alex, I am honored and very, very excited to be with you. And I really, uh, want to commend IIEA and ESB for working together to put on this very, very timely discussion. Uh, uh, we just have a terrific uh, partnership between uh, your electric and ESB and Edison Electric Institute uh, on where we share ideas and policies and technologies with each other uh, to provide customers around the world with clean, affordable and reliable electricity. And, uh, and I think that partnership is more important than ever. And I really am very excited to be with my friend, Pat O'Doherty. Pat uh, has been such a great, great global leader uh, on electricity and energy issues. And uh, uh, it's always wonderful to, uh, to be with him. Climate change is certainly one of the greatest challenges of our time. Uh, and it, it is a global issue. And in that context, it requires global solutions. And I'm happy to report that electric utility companies around the world are leading a profound energy transformation. So it's a, a very, very exciting time for our industry. And customers are our North Star. Customers are demanding that we have in the future a much cleaner electricity system, that we have a modernized grid, and that we have advanced customer solutions. So, uh, uh, and we are very, very much up to the task. Certainly the politics in our country have changed a great deal. Uh, President Biden uh, has climate change as one of his highest priorities uh, on his very first day in office. He rejoined the Paris Agreement uh, and he committed to uh, be a major participant in COP26. Uh, we at EEI are sending a delegation of uh, CEOs uh, to participate and we also give it the highest priority. And I really think that uh, as an industry, we are very, very well positioned to be a major part of the solution to climate change. And we want to be a major part of the solution to climate change. 
our track record so far is pretty impressive. In the United States, we have reduced our climate emissions 40% from the year 2005. Uh, now, the original Paris commitment that was made by President Obama was talking about 28% uh, and by the year 2030. Uh, so we're way above that target a decade early, and we're continuing uh, and very much committed to continuing that major progress. Uh, so I think that 40% um, of our energy is now carbon free, nuclear, hydro, uh, wind and solar. And uh, again, uh, we are making very, very rapid strides. Uh, so we're very excited about that. And, uh, and, uh, and our emissions at the, are at the lowest level in 40 years. So one of our principles was, is and always has been uh, to uh, uh, do this on an economy-wide basis. Uh, so not just the electric sector. Uh, and we think with the electric sector becoming increasingly clean, uh, it gives us a great opportunity to uh, electrify the transportation sector and eventually the commercial industrial sector. And that is uh, the real way to uh, to get to net zero. So it is an exciting time because that has changed dramatically as well. Uh, it was a very tough situation at first to convince people to move toward electric vehicles, to convince automobile companies to do that. But now we see every major automobile country company in the in the world right now committed to electric transportation in its future. Certainly, uh, we have the technologies now uh, to uh, make great strides as we already have at the 40% level. We could probably get to the 80% level uh, with existing technologies, but we're also gonna need new technologies. Uh, so it is very, very important for us right now to have major partnerships with our governments to uh, um, move forward new, new zero uh, carbon technologies that can be available 24 seven and whether or not they be uh, energy storage or hydrogen or carbon capture and storage or advanced nuclear or others, uh, we must accelerate that. And we are advocating very hard with environmental groups and with uh, labor unions to uh, uh, triple our budget in the United States so with respect to advancing new technologies. Um, so reliability and affordability remain a, a core principle for us. Um, you know, it, it, electricity is so important to our economy and to our customers. And some customers have uh, low incomes and have very, very difficult uh, time um, facing increasing energy costs. So uh, this remains a major principle for us. And, uh, and I think that, again, we've been able to do uh, the 40% while keeping electricity rates at or below the level of inflation. And we wanna continue that in the future. And wind and solar and, um, and hydro and uh, along with nuclear and uh, natural gas can help us uh, reach these goals. Well, the pandemic um, certainly illustrated the importance of electricity to everyone. Uh, and uh, we were declared a critical uh, infrastructure industry by the president uh, and our government that helped us do a very, very good job of keeping uh, the lights on uh, and uh, you know, keeping the economy moving too. But the other important factor I think is international collaboration is gonna be essential for us to continue to work together on the, in the international front to make sure we can achieve the goals, we can uh, uh, share technologies, we can share policies that are gonna help us to get there. Uh, so again, I, I thank IIEA and ESB for putting on this uh, tremendous program here. That's terrific. Um, thank you very much for those um, opening remarks. And as I say, it's, it's just so great to have you um, with us so we can have this span the Atlantic in terms of addressing, addressing this debate. Um, I should have mentioned at the outset that what the format is, so our members and people who are used to being on board for these seminars would be reasonably familiar with the way we do things. We have a speaker and then we have a Q&A session. A little bit different today because you'll appreciate we've got two outstanding speakers. Uh, so our format is, is, is going to be a little bit different. You've heard from Thomas, you'll hear more from him in a few minutes. You're going to hear from Pat O'Doherty in a moment. Um, and then after that, what we're going to do is I'm going to moderate, I suppose, a kind of a conversation. We'll call it a fireside 
but you know, no, we're not supposed to have fires, fires anymore, open fires anymore. So we don't have an actual fire. But you know, you, you get the point. We're going to have a conversation between the three of us, principally, obviously, our two, our, our two guests. I'll, I'll moderate that, and then um, there will still, of course, be an opportunity for you to ask a question. So there's a Q and A function uh, on uh, on your screen there that you'll be familiar with. Um, please join in using that Q and A function. You're welcome to do it. Um, Q&A function on Zoom. Um, send in your question at any point. If you've got something you'd like to ask Thomas that you've heard about already, put the question in now, don't wait. Um, we've got to give us a chance to have a look at the questions. Keep them fairly short, reasonably succinct. You'll appreciate your, your typing away in your computer. We're happy to read it then as well. So the shorter, the more succinct, the more likely it is that we are going to uh, get to them. So put them in there, put in a question as soon as it occurs to you. We would respectfully ask you just to say who you are, give your name and your affiliation and organisation if you represent, just um, uh, for the sake of completeness. All of this session today is on the record, uh, just to let you know that. And uh, if you feel up to tweeting, um, you're on Twitter, you could use the hashtag, which is hashtag Rethink Energy. So we're very happy to have your participation. And uh, once again, thanks to Thomas. Our second speaker, distinguished speaker, is Pat O'Doherty, Chief Executive of the ESB, who was appointed to that post in 2011 uh, and to the board of the ESB in 2013. Pat completed his tenure as president of Euroelectric in May uh, of this year, May 2021. Euroelectric is the sector association which represents the common interests uh, of the electricity industry across 32 European countries and covers all major issues affecting the sector from generation and markets to distribution networks and customer issues. Um, Pat O'Doherty holds a primary and master's degree in engineering from University College Dublin. He completed the advanced management program at Harvard and he is also director of a director of Energy UK and a former trustee of the conference board of the United States. I'm sure I could say an awful lot more Pat um, but we, we can't take up too much more time of your time. And I, once again, delighted to invite you to address us this afternoon. Pat O'Doherty. Good afternoon, Alex. And thank you very much. And good afternoon, everybody. And uh, good afternoon, Tom. It's great to be sharing this platform with you. We go back a long way. And it's an awful pity. I know you would have relished to come to a visit to Ireland, but sadly, we haven't been able to do that either on my watch as president of your electric or chief executive of ESP. But um, this is the best we could get. So it's, it's uh, we've had great debates down the years and it's great to share this platform with you. And you're you're very welcome virtually to uh, to Dublin and to Ireland. And I suppose as I reflect on where we're at, uh, you know, look, it goes without saying we're in the middle of the biggest uh, disruption known to the global society in living memory. And yeah, climate change is still a part of the policy agenda. And if you think back to when we came out, particularly here in Ireland, but in Europe also, when we came out of the recession coming out of the, from, that arose from, 19, from 2008, uh, that recovery was driven off the back of low fossil fuel prices. And we should remember that as we come out of the back of this crisis, this pandemic. There's no doubt that climate change is here. And we should grasp, we all need to grasp this opportunity while it still remains an opportunity rather than an absolutely dire necessity. We are seeing extreme weather events, so climate change is here and now. And the European policy response is very, very, very comprehensive. And it is built on uh, the learnings from coming out of the recession a decade ago. So in Europe, we're legislating for net zero by 2050 and about to kick off process, which will greatly increase the ambition through 2030 uh, 2040 and on to 2050, the so-called Fit for 55 package, which is working its way uh, through the organs of Europe. Uh, and we, we will see that in July, hopefully. Um, and it, of course, this has been approached in Europe through a truly holistic lens of the Green Deal. And it's all encompassing in terms of the transition to net zero, embracing competitiveness, EU competitiveness on the one hand, the environment, agriculture and biodiversity. Um, and this, of course, will all feed into, you know, has feed, it derives from the EU's commitment on the Paris Agreement and will feed into COP. And of course, the EU or the UK now, which is outside of Europe, but in, is still a big thought leader in Europe uh, and globally, indeed, in, in the move to net, in net zero. And the UK is following that similar track. I suppose COVID has shown what a global coordinated response can do when we're faced with a common 
enemy and it is definitely a blueprint for attacking climate change but the the effort and the pace and tom has mentioned this is truly staggering the next 30 years we must wean ourselves off fossil fuels in so many aspects of our lives and as consumers and we could if we regard ourselves as consumers of carbon maybe it's an interesting way of thinking about it but we need to make choices as consumers about how we live our lives in our homes how we upgrade our homes how we build new homes as a society reduce the amount of waste we create, use more public transport, move to EVs then when public transport isn't available to us. Um, <clears throat> and this is the change that we're living. So we're living today and this decade is the change that we've talked about that's been coming for quite a while. Um, and I've no doubt that we can get to 2050, which is a much, much better version of what we have today and a vision for society and what we have today. But there's a lot of difficult choices that we all have to make we all have to make as a society and how we move forward as a society and all of the stakeholders in that society for the future that we want is, is how we all do that together is very very important and again just picking up on something that tom said about the electricity industry the electricity industry in ireland and in europe has done a lot of the heavy lifting so far in this i'm really excited uh, about the, about the role the electricity industry has to play I just, I just wish I was coming into this industry, Alex, rather than maybe leaving it in my former role as ESB chief executive shortly. Um, but, you know, the one thing I, as we've reflected on the role of electricity in the last decade, we've been, in our industry, we've been pre preparing our industry for this. It's the transformative role that electricity has played in the last 100 years. The society and the economies we have today are underpinned by the electricity system. And that's even going to be more so in the future and that is the opportunity that we have electricity is the most versatile unit of energy out there and we would need to be meeting well over 60 percent of final energy consumption from it um, in europe the power sector is in good shape uh, you know by the first half of 2020 60 percent of the power mix in europe was decarbonized this will grow to almost 70 percent over the next five years and 80 percent in 2030 um, for Ireland, we know what the solution is. We know, you know, we know, we know that it's going to be wind. We have huge wind resources onshore and offshore. Solar is becoming much, much more feasible and possible now. But I suppose the big issue for Ireland, and Tom touched on this in terms of security of supply and reliability of supply, we won't have an energy transition if we don't have a reliable supply in the transition. And we have to reimagine the system we have today, which is underpinned by reliability. To something very different, which should also will also have to be underpinned by reliability. So for our the big challenge then is how we how we replace dispatchable generation that today is predominantly fossil fuel based, uh, because Ireland doesn't have the kind of the hydro resources or other non carbon source of generation that other countries have. Um, but so that's the final piece of the jigsaw, I suppose, in Ireland that has to kind of fall into place. Uh, I'm very upbeat and very confident uh, for the sector. I'm very upbeat and confident that the role that the sector will play, and I've given a you know a positive view of how that uh, you know of, of that. Uh, but it requires again, Tom, to everybody coming together, deep, deep, deep collaboration between industry, uh, between academia, between all sectors of industry, between the customer, the consumer, and society. And it's really about back to that point I made earlier about what is the type of society we all want in the future and then the role of the energy sector and the electricity sector in particular is actually then being a big part of facilitating and enabling that. Thank you so much Pat and I, I just really love the way you put the emphasis just in your closing sentences there on the societal aspect you know that it's look there are big people talk about business opportunities they talk about the the need to have these huge adjustments of the kind of economy we have, the sort of energy reliance we have, all of these big questions, big engineering questions, if you like, big calls. But your emphasis on the societal point, I think, is well made. And actually, you both talked about, you know, the scale of the of the changes that we all have to make as citizens. Um, and I'm wondering about either of your perspectives or both of your perspectives on how engaged in this agenda you think citizens actually are. I know what you think about what maybe it, it, it should be or it needs to be. Um, 
how, where do you think, you know, it's a huge question, where do you think the people of the US, I mean, there's so many and it's such a complex thing with Europe, but like just as a broad brushstroke thing, how engaged do you think citizens are in this agenda? And what's a good way or what's the best way to get kind of citizen buy-in or, 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 or citizen, get people to believe they really and see that they have a stake in the changes that lie ahead. I'll go to you, back to you, Tom, first, if I may, in Maryland. Thanks, Alex. And I think you all can tell just um, how enthusiastic and committed uh, both Pat and I are. And I think that's reflected um, in the leadership across our industry. It's a very, very exciting time for us. Uh, and as I said, we really are very committed to being part of the uh, climate solution. And I, you know, that's that's a, a major change I think in our industry over the years. Uh, and and in terms of our customers, uh, I I've just seen a major driver of this whole situation is our customers. Uh, and it started out with the tech companies, the high tech companies that wanted to be green. Now it's going, uh, you know, across the board and industries, uh, whether or not it be, you know, UPS, FedEx, you name it, uh, and. Yesterday or this week, uh, 80 major companies uh, wrote a letter to the White House saying that they wanted to uh, achieve major carbon reduction emissions goals. So we're getting that support. We have labor support now for making these changes. We have uh, obviously environmental group support. States, cities, and towns are, uh, are stepping up and uh, offering their support and, uh, and setting their own goals. Uh, so I really think the politics are changing. Obviously, uh, uh, as you mentioned, Alex, with the increasing amount of storms and hurricanes and, and wildfires and things of that nature every day, there's uh, new illustrations of how climate change is changing our, our life and our world. Uh, but uh, I think that customers and uh, citizens are becoming a major driver of this whole transformation. You, what do you think, Pat? Do you think that's true? Have you seen a change in that, the nature of people's yeah. belief that they have a stake in this? I think, Alex, we're beginning to see that. We're beginning to see bigger interest in, in, in the role that electricity and energy plays in how people live their lives and how they live their lives in a, in a, in a, a will live their lives in a low carbon world. Um, like where we're doing, we have a, we've a project, uh, uh, um, a, a, a project down in Dingle. Uh, Dingle Tom is in the far southwest of the country. Um, and it's a project that is, is, is looking at the role of citizens and the interaction between citizens and the power system in a, in a, in a world where the resources are constrained. So the network may be constrained at certain times of the year um, and how people will, 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 will invest in technology uh, to, live, to, to lower their own carbon footprint. So solar panels, electric vehicles and how they will participate in demand side management. And we're completely blown away by the level of interest. Once you give people the tools to understand, first of all, that the impact of how they live their lives is, are having, and then you give them the tools then to, to actually change that and do something about that, uh, you, you, you get a remarkable level of interest because electricity is very much a taken for granted commodity. And I suppose if we in the industry are really honest about the last 90 years, you know, we talk about customer, but really, do we really deeply understand what motivates and what drives the customers to make the decisions that they make? And the re reality is we don't and we didn't. That will change now as new technologies available for us to put that information in people's hands. And as people start seeing what they can do to change things, drive their own change and drive a wider societal change. So we're seeing that through this kind of uh, you know, to this particular project. We're also seeing it in some of the work we do with customers, with customer focus groups, uh, smart metering, for example. And, um, you know, again, you know, suppliers giving tariff offerings to customers where they can get value by using, by making choices about when and how they use their electricity and indeed what price they pay for it, you get a response. Then on the other side, there's a big, big, big role for policy here. Policy as a driver, in terms of setting standards and making demands on the construction sector and on businesses and indeed on society. And I suppose Alex, a wider thing in this is like there's definitely more engagement, but there's still a lot of people who are not engaged. And the other piece of that is are people not engaged because they can't engage, they can't afford to engage, they're vulnerable. This cannot be a transition that only plays to those who can afford it. 
it has to be a wider transition for all. And isn't that isn't there a genuine risk there that you know some people get left behind and and some communities get left left behind? Whether it's because they are they come from poorer communities or or less engaged for whatever reason, and, and that's not that's not a value judgment on people. It's just the likelihood the things moving so fast that you know some people, perhaps even most people, may move with that, but there could be very large minorities of people who who are left behind and we have the whole debate about how that plays into you know stranded assets like the older the older infrastructure will still be there for people who perhaps don't or can't or don't wish to move and then you've got these new developments as well i mean pat do you think that that is a risk i mean i mean yeah, that's, that's, I, I, that's that's a risk alex but yeah. but interestingly i believe that that's a risk that is like ultimately who, who who's best placed to deal with that risk to point out risk it's us in the sector and it's government and policy. So, if supports only go to those who who can uh, who can afford to invest in technology, mm. and then you leave the fixed cost of the legacy infrastructure behind for those who can't afford, and their electricity price becomes higher as a result of that, mm. that's the wrong answer for society. So, and, that, that, so yeah. mm. and, and I'm sure, Tom, that's that's something that it must be a preoccupation for 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 you guys as well in the US. I imagine that there are whole areas and whole communities that perhaps are at risk of, 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 of kind of being slower movers than others. Again, not to make a value judgment, just because of where, what people's circumstances are, they're, they're poorer, they're less connect, they're less sort of engaged and so on. Your mic, I think, yeah, good man. I think this is uh, why the clean energy future is gonna be so wonderful because it's gonna benefit all customers. Uh, mm -hmm. So we are totally focused on, on affordability and making sure that, that electricity can be affordable for all customers. Uh, but environmental justice has been, uh, is a major issue for our industry, for our president, and for our Congress, uh, where industrial facilities have often uh, been uh, cited in, uh, in, in underserved in uh, 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 neighborhoods. And I think that, uh, I think that you know, it is very, very important now as we move to the clean energy economy that we let those customers benefit, uh, that we let, uh, you know, we are, are focused on diversity, equity, and inclusion uh, among our companies. We want to have our employees look like the customers and communities we serve, and we mm -hmm. want to be majorly focused on those areas. Uh, but I do think that, uh, again, the clean energy future gives us an opportunity to uh, really focus on these issues and on the transformation to make sure that all customers are benefiting. Hmm. I'm just going to stay with you, um, Thomas. Uh, you've both, I suppose you've both painted a picture of you know, 2030, 2050, these timelines that we're, 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 we're all familiar with and that we're, we see very much as, as objectives, as necessary objectives uh, for zero carbon electricity. And I suppose, you know, we're, we're, we're all committed to that or we, we, we see the, the necessity and the importance of having those kind of objectives. But as in the shorter term, Pat, I think you certainly touched on it, perhaps you did too as well, Tom, the question of security of supply is always there and will, will, will always raise its head. And I suppose on this side of the Atlantic, Tom, we've, you know, we've, we've seen, even though we're a good distance away, we, we, we can see in the news that the, the challenges in Texas and California and even actually closer to home uh, now, recently, very recently, we've seen uh, uh, one or two reports of uh, concerns about uh, electricity security here. So, Tom, going to you first, just on this, these potential challenges of security of supply and some of these, these big events or worrying events that we've seen in recent times. Well, reliability has always been priority number one for our industry. Uh, there is nothing that is a, a bigger problem and, than it. The electricity is off. And uh, so I do think that the situation is very, very critical that we focus on this part of the equation. We make sure that as we make this transformation, that reliability remains priority number one. Uh, you mentioned uh, California and Texas. Uh, they were glaring examples of things that we've got to make sure don't happen in the future. Uh, we have to make sure we have the the mix of uh, resources. Uh, we have to add new technologies onto the system. Uh, uh, this is why natural gas is so important right now because it is an important part of the uh, balancing uh, of the system and the, acting as a battery along with those uh, existing nuclear plants that uh, maintain a 24-7 carbon-free <laughs> as well. 
Uh, and I think that um, it's, it's uh, energy storage is important, new technologies, microgrids. Uh, we are, are making, uh, we are the most capital intensive industry in the country, making investments of over $138 billion. And much of that focus is on resilience and security of supply. Uh, because again, um, I think Pat said it before, uh, the transition is not gonna happen if customers are upset as they move more and more toward electricity electricity for transportation, electricity for commercial industrial purposes, if that electricity is not. And Pat, in Ireland in particular, I mean, the challenge of reconciling this rapid change that we need, that you've spoken about, that we need, reconciling that with the, the everyday and the continuing challenge of ensuring the supply is there. And, you know, we don't have nuclear, we don't, we've, well, we have hydro, but it's relatively limited in overall terms. You know, it's so, so our options are fewer. Um, there's the debate about gas uh, happening all the time about how quickly uh, that, that, that can be a transformation, that, that agenda. So what's your answer to the, to, to, to the overall problem of, it's a big question, what's your answer to the overall yeah. problem of supply? How does yeah. that fit into the picture for you? Uh, you know, our, Ireland has, uh, has achieved it's a worldwide position, like we're, we're in the top two or three in Europe in terms of wind penetration per capita. We're an island country. We don't have much interconnection. It's a staggering uh, technological achievement. Um, like we, we, we can have wind generating 60, 70% of electricity at certain times, you know, but in the round last year, over 40% of electricity in Ireland was generated by renewables. And that was, you know, that was deemed to be bordering impossible at, or just over a decade ago when we started that. Going to 70% now is going to be a huge challenge, there's no doubt about that. Um, and as I said, the kind of secret sauce that we have to get to is what, what replaces dispatchable. So today, dispatchable generation is hydro. So it's a few percent for Ireland. Uh, and then it's coal and it's gas. And coal will be gone out in Ireland in the, in the coming years. So gas, and Tom said this, is a, is a very, very important transition fuel for us in Ireland. And you know what happens to replace gas then? You know, the carbon capture and storage for years was talked about. You know, carbon capture storage is still on the table. Uh, in some, but it's expensive, it's inefficient. Hydrogen is another one. It's a long, long way away. Uh, so as we pick our way through this forest of uncertainty, as I call it, we have to have, uh, you know, gas as a backup. Interconnection won't do it either. So the, in the future, the, you know, what does the power system look like? Another piece of this is going to be the role of demand and managing and moderating demand based on economic signals in the marketplace. We're very, very early days at that. So the market design has to fit uh, and has to evolve to make all of this happen. Um, and, and that is going to be the real challenge. Um, so, you know, can we do it? Of course we can do it. Um, but I, I think it's really, really important to keep as much of an eye on that reliability and security piece. That old, that age old trilemma that we talked about, it's still the challenge today. Hmm. Um, and and so, so there's no silver bullet for this. There's no magic answer uh, that's going yeah. to get us there. And, and isn't it, not, not to draw you into the, the, the policy area too much, or at least not into the politics, certainly, but the, the policy area is obviously something you're both interested in, what the policy environment is. And isn't that a challenge for, for policymakers? Well, it's a challenge for, for everybody, really, to, to try to work out this glide path. I mean, you, you find yourself, I suppose, as a policymaker, you still have to, as it were, justify, maybe that's the wrong word, or explain why gas would still be very much in the mix and likely to be so for some considerable time, even though you might feel you want it gone at some point. Let's take coal. Coal might be a, the sort of, that's the one staring us in the face and yeah. that's only got just about a few years. But at the same time, you know, you, you, you can say, and I remember you saying it to me when I was minister, look, you know, ultimately we, we can't have coal, but if you're saying to me, we can't have coal and money point next week, that simply is not a prospect. That's yeah. simply just not, not, not a proposition that, that lasts uh, any kind of scrutiny. So that broader debate needs to get a little bit more subtle yeah. about this glide path, I think. And I, and I think, Alex, if I remember your response when I said that to you was, well, Pat, you know, you know, you're, you know, there's this perception that maybe the industry wants to hold on to this stuff forever. So kind of, Lord, I'll fix it later on rather than yeah. now, you know. And yeah. somewhere, yeah. so the political difficulty is there has, there has to be tension in the system. There has to be unreasonable demands 
placed on technology, yeah. placed on market participants. Politically, there has to be. And then there has to be then some kind of sensible, rational kind of picking our way through this. Yeah. And it's easier for me as a non-politician, Alex, to say that from where I, yeah. from where I sit. But that that's like it, it's politically like Ireland must show cause in the interna- in, in, internationally. We must do that. And there must be, unre- as I said, we, mo- we must have a, an unforgiving, unreasonable drive to make, to make this better, sure. while at the same time keeping away on what's practical, keeping an eye on what's practical. Similarly, Tom, I won't draw you into the politics, but I, I will ask you a little bit about <coughs> the policy environment. Uh, there's, you mentioned Joe Biden, I think, a couple of times. There's a new president. There seems to be a completely new atmosphere in terms of the way this issue and this agenda is being addressed. Um, and I think it's not being overly political to say that most people, I think, or very many people in the world will be welcoming that. Uh, and and the, the, you know, the approach has been taken by John Kerry and, uh, and so on. So how do you interact with or do you find yourself interacting with the political system in terms of how the political, how the politicians address these questions uh, and, and try to keep their voters, frankly, while at the same time making the changes that are needed? Just uh, the mute, the, the mic, the, the, yeah. Here we go. You're very, no, you're grand. We uh, are very, very closely working with the, uh, with the uh, Biden administration and with the uh, Congress. And uh, we work on a bipartisan basis. Uh, and, and again, as, if, as an industry that works with people on both sides of the aisle, uh, uh, that uh, works with, Republican and Democratic governors and state legislators and regulators, et cetera. We want to be part of the solution. And I think policymakers uh, throughout the world really are amazed at the uh, progress our industry has made with respect to uh, an industry that does make long-term investments that uh, uh, that has a major capital expenditures. The, the transformation that we've made over the last decade that we intend to make into the future has been uh, really, I think, pretty remarkable. Um, and so people, uh, policymakers, again, are very, very interested in working with us. Uh, we have been successful at keeping uh, electricity rates down below the level of inflation. Uh, and we've done it with the help of, of new technologies. Uh, we've done it with the help of uh, um, you know, tax incentives that uh, have helped to drive down the cost dramatically. Uh, of these technologies, uh, that that has benefited customers in a major way, uh, and I think that um, you know there are policies that are being debated right now, and uh, and we think will be continued, and we think are going to be incredibly enforced. Uh, you know, there's an interesting debate going on all over the world, I suppose, about this, it, particularly pandemic and post-pandemic, just about the role of the state generally, the role of you know state actors and so forth versus the market. So, you know, I think there would be a, a, a big kind of area of thinking that would say the market ultimately will, will decide. The market will decide on pricing, the market will decide on, you know, technologies, what survives, what doesn't survive. I wonder, Tom, do you, do you think, you know, the current market structures that we have, well, first of all, I, 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 do you think the market must be supreme in, in, in most of these decisions? Or do you think that, uh, uh, you know, what role, for example, does carbon pricing have? Is, is, does, the market, is the market determine, does the market determine what happens? Uh, I don't think it, is, it does exclusively, Alex. I think the, uh, you know, things get determined by technologies, by public policies, uh, and by markets and customers. Uh, and I think that basically, uh, Markets are very, very important, and we should, and we are continuing to look at new market structures that uh, uh, encourage and, and, and enhance energy efficiency and demand management, uh, mm-hmm. and uh, you know, and move the technologies forward that we need to move. But uh, I mean, you know, yeah. again, uh, for for us, it's largely been driven by uh, by tax policies uh, and incentivizing tax policies. Uh, uh, a major debate in our country right now is over a clean energy standard or clean energy uh, incentives that help uh, make sure that we uh, continue to be able to get to where we need to get to by 2030, for example. Uh, so um, those debates are, are, are similar around the world, but but may come to different conclusions. I know uh, carbon pricing is an important part of the equation in, uh, 
in uh, in Europe and maybe a little bit less important in the United States. Yeah, see, that that certainly seems seems so. I mean, Pat, on the on that, I mean, what, there, I think some thinkers, some observers talk about the this tension between the state and the market, that maybe the role for the state is to define markets. In other words, to, you know, the, certainly some of the yeah. thinkers say that the market will, will always have a role and that really the state can actually determine, not that the market determines what happens, but the state can determine what kind of market you have and can define the parameters of that market. And then uh, the, so not... what do you think about that? And also what do you think about car, the, the contribution of carbon pricing? Yeah, I'm... That? I'm smiling as I was listening to Tom there because some of the heated debates he and I have had is about the difference between markets in Europe and markets in the US mm. and the role of carbon. So in, in Europe, carbon has a price and that's going to drive everything. And that's something actually I, 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 I would fundamentally believe in. I'd even go so far as saying uh, that ideally where you'd like to get to is carbon at the price of real consumption in everything right out at the consumer. But that's a pipe dream because politically that's just not possible. Um, but carbon has a role to play. I think carbon pricing and in Europe, the price of carbon is going to go up. There's a trajectory has been set for rising prices of carbon and that's going to drive the alternatives. In, ter in terms of market and market design, you know, there would have been this view maybe a decade and a half ago that everything is due to market and pure market is going to drive everything. I don't believe that at all. And I say Tom has just said something similar. Uh, I think this is just too important for citizen societies, for the political system to stand back and let the market just cut loose. It's just not, it's just, so now what's the next thing is the, is the role of government and policy and regulators in market design. And the market design will have to evolve as we transition to wherever the end game is. Um, so, so government and regulators in particular have a real role to play in market design and market designs will have to evolve, they won't stay fixed. Um, so, so, you know, that, that I don't know, Alex, if that answers the question. Yeah. You, um, sure. you, you, you asked me there, but uh, but yeah, no, I, yeah. I, I said government, government, governments cannot be far away and policy cannot be far away from market design. Sure. No, that's great. I'm going to go to some questions that we've got coming in from um, our um, participants, our audience. Uh, and the um, first one um, is from Sarah Cullen, I'm going to go to. Sarah Cullen is um, 18 for zero. Um, and she, Sarah says, Mr. Kuhn mentioned nuclear power several times as having the importance um, in America's clean energy mix. And Sarah says, it's interesting to hear Pat O'Doherty talk about Ireland's dilemma in replacing fossil fuels in dispatchable power when we don't have a large hydro resource. If the legislative barriers to developing nuclear power in Ireland were removed, um, would it be worth considering uh, um, seriously uh, that approach in Ireland? I think she means if the legislative barriers were, were removed, would nuclear power be something that would be considered, might be considered? I'm sure you'd be treading carefully here, um, Pat, but there you go. Maybe maybe less carefully, Alex, than I might have been tried this yeah. years ago. Yeah, uh, good, good. I, I, I think the issue of nuclear power, in a, for as as we know, nuclear power is illegal in Ireland, so the legend, mm. so it can't it can't happen, mm. right? But I think I I think what would put real pressure into the debate now. There's an ideological issue around nuclear, so leave that to one side. I come at this from a technologist and a marketing perspective and a market perspective, um, and I suppose in my in my head. Uh, there, you know, in the terms of replacing gas, there's a race to replace gas with something, right? Mm -hmm. If that something becomes hydrogen anytime soon uh, uh, and we can manage that transition, but I think hydro uh, now there's huge cost issues and commercials around hydrogen, then hydrogen then may displace the nuclear debate for the likes of Ireland. If it doesn't, I think nuclear debate could come back on the table. But I think something else has to happen with nuclear as well then for nuclear to be, is the size of the nuclear like nuclear reactors make sense at a staggering scale, which are too big for Ireland. So in a way, it's an easy thing to, to dismiss nuclear in Ireland today because we would need something yeah. of the order of a gas turbine, the conventional gas turbine in Ireland, about 400 megawatts. Uh, now, there's probably somebody in the audience here who will come in immediately and say, we have that technology. There's all kinds of modular nuclear reactor technology available today. Um, but, but I think the debate, Alex, is first and foremost a political one. It's an ideological one. And then it's something about because nuclear is a 50, 60 year bet 
And is there a different 50 or 60 year bet which might obviate the need for nuclear? And that's probably the hydrogen debate. Yeah. Um, I'll go to you, Tom. I've got a question from Daniel Barnes, um, GDF Suez. And Daniel says, what, well, he says, what a great panel this afternoon. And we can only agree with Daniel on that. Terrific uh, two speakers that we have. What are the biggest challenges facing battery storage? Daniel would like to know. From you, Tom. <laughs> well, I, I, th I think battery storage has an amazing uh, promise in the future. And, uh, uh, and, and in the present, in fact, battery storage is uh, uh, growing dramatically in our country. And... Uh, for all aspects of the electric system, uh, the obviously uh, uh, the distribution part of the system, the transmission part of the system, and the generation side of the equation, uh, and for you know individuals' personal uses uh, uh, in connection with solar on solar rooftops. But I, I th you know, battery storage is somewhat limited uh, in duration right now to four to eight hours, and uh, most of the research that's going on is extending that uh, and looking for long-term storage. Uh, uh, and I think there's some very, very promising developments happening. Uh, technology's moving forward. There's certainly a lot of emphasis being put onto it, but uh, we get uh, storage that uh, can last a few weeks and uh, things of that nature. You'll, you'll see uh, the storage situation change tremendously. You agree, Pat? I do indeed, yeah. I think battery, battery like, you know, if people said we're putting we we're going to be putting 100 megawatt batteries in the power system five years ago, even they'd have laughed at you. So that just shows how the technology has evolved. I think batteries have a huge role to play in that. As again, there is no single silver bullet, and then part of that mix is going to make up this reimagined electricity system. Batteries of all sizes and hues, whether at an industry level, some people will power batteries in their homes. What's going to happen to batteries in electric vehicles? If you've got a million EVs on the road, what's going to happen to all of those when they're connected to chargers? So battery technology, whether grid scale or, or small ones, has a, has a big role to play. There's a lovely question here from uh, Tara Kelly out in the ESP, actually. And I'm going to put it to you, uh, Tom, um, because it's a lovely, it's a nice connection with the COVID. What, what we've, you know, we've been just ob observing everything that's happened in the last year and a half and happened to the world and to humanity. And she said, when COVID hit, people turned to nature for comfort be it in gardens, in parks, or beaches. And if, if nature turns on people, we'll have nowhere to go, Tara says. And she's wondering, is there an opportunity now, uh, almost as it were, even driven by the COVID? I mean, we never wanted the pandemic, of course, but it's happened and we're, we're, we're feeling our way out of it, looking to the future. Like, can we take almost like a kind of an inspiration from, 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 what, from what's happened and how we've approached it to drive the carbon reduction message further and, and clearer than we did in pre-COVID times? Well, I think, uh, I think you're right on target. And I think that is happening. And I, I am very, very optimistic like you are that, uh, again, we are, are, are moving toward a cleaner world and much more world that uh, is in connection with uh, with nature, uh, that we are moving toward an electrified world, that uh, we're bringing on more distributed energy technologies, uh, I think that uh, are very, very helpful. Um, the pandemic uh, also, we're moving toward a more digitalized world as well that is dependent upon electricity. And there are some scary parts of that, uh, like uh, cyber, uh, where we're putting a great deal of attention on the cyber issue in our country and we've seen examples of ransomware attacks and uh and disruptions in the energy sector we want to make sure uh that in the future uh that particularly the electric sector we have a partnership with the government to uh, uh to make sure that operational technology we use in the electric sector uh, is not affected uh, by cyber attacks but i think that'll be a major focus because i think that's something that goes against nature for sure yeah uh, but um, and I, I am very, very optimistic that, that we're moving toward a much, much better world and a cleaner world. Uh, mm. so I fully agree with your premise. Yeah, I, I, I the, the, um, not mine, but the premise of Tara Kelly, and it's a really a ter ter terrific question. I'm going to go back to Pat on that cyber, since Tom brought up the issue of the, the cyber uh, threat and the, that whole sort of digital advances have been almost like kind of mind blowing and. Um, and now we have this this uh, almost weekly uh, uh, reports of you know uh, 
cyber attacks and, and threats of cyber attacks and so on. Do you want to do you want to add anything to that? What Tom said about that. You know, like when we when we talk about the reliability of the power system now, cyber by design is embedded in that. We have all kinds of technologies from control systems, SCADA systems, uh, automation. And there's just going to be more and more of that reaching into the network. And then as the network reaches into people's homes through smart metering, it's digital, it's digital end to end from the from the power station, whether the power station is a conventional power station, a nuclear power station, or a wind farm, all the way to people's homes. There's tech all along that and it's all interconnected. And the only way the power system of the future, this reimagined power system that we talk about for this low carbon to zero carbon world and net zero world in 2050, technology and digital plays a real part in optimizing the resources, the length and breadth of the value chain and right through to the choice the customer makes. So cyber embedded in the design from the very start, sorry, cyber defense embedded in the design from the very, very start is really, really, really important. Um, and that's, that's again why, back to, in a way, back to the question around markets as well, Tom, is that, you know, we, we, we did, this is a critical infrastructure, this is a critical industry. So, so, you know, markets don't always reward the kind of investments that you meet, need to make to maintain the reliability and the security of the system. So that's where the regulator comes in. And to be fair, the regulators see this as a big part of their role. Uh, but but, but cyber, what we call it needs to be the same as, as cyber by design in every component of the infrastructure. That's in cyber defense by design. You know, Alex, I'd like to pipe yeah, in no, another thing. Too, yeah. I just, I just uh, think that the, uh, the, the workers in our industry are the real heroes. Uh, the pandemic showed um, you know, many of us that, that the mission essential workers, uh, the people that were out in the front lines, the people that, uh, that kept the lights on uh, were the real heroes. Uh, and we have a uh, line worker appreciation day designated by Congress this uh, uh, tomorrow, as a matter of fact, uh, to recognize those people because they go out and restore power after hurricanes and derechos and wildfires, et cetera. Um, and uh, it's just an industry that, uh, comes together and helps each other, uh, where mutual assistance is paramount, uh, where we don't point fingers at each other, we work together to uh, make sure we keep the lights on. Brilliant. Um, I suppose this is probably one principally for, for you, Pat, um, but I, I'm sure Tom would have some, uh, perhaps some insights from the experience of the States. What are the limits to the contribution more interconnectivity could make to uh, our becoming net zero in Ireland. So, <clears throat> in, here, but, yeah. Yeah. In, in, interconnection has has a has a big role to play, and I suppose the difference between Europe and America is is that um, you know, the European power system has grown up very much around uh, countries, national national borders, yeah. with some limited interconnection. Part of the EU drive now is to increase the amount of, 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 of interconnection. Um, but again, as we're working our way through the transition, so we, we have um, what about, about a, a gigawatt of interconnection with Britain at the moment. There's another gigawatt plan between France and Britain on a, on, on a peak on the island of so over seven gigawatts. Um, but so you have to take interconnection into the design of your system security standard. Uh, otherwise, the guy, the neighbor you're connected to has to keep your lights on. And we're not sophisticated enough yet in Europe uh, to actually have a, a European wide planning of the power system. But that's where it has to get to, because if you take the vision for the future, there's lots of floating offshore wind on the west coast of Ireland, hydro in the Balkans, in the Alps and in the Nordics and solar in southern Europe, all connected together in some way to keep Europe's lights on. But again, part of that transition is is it, you know is keeping the lights on in the transition so interconnection has a role to play and um, limited but becoming increasingly important but you have to make sure then that that secure supply piece then is is, is catered for if you're dependent on interconnection sure i don't know tom if you have any thoughts on that obviously the conditions in the us are quite different and the land mass context is different and the states and, and and so on being how they operate i don't know if there's are there any are there any is there any is there any advice or any even observation that you have from there about the importance of interconnect 
activity. I, I think in, in both sides of the Atlantic, uh, this issue is incredibly important. Interconnection is so incredibly important and critical to delivering uh, clean energy technologies to where they need to be, uh, to making sure we maintain the reliability of the system that came into play in Texas, as you indicated, uh, where we needed uh, more transmission uh, into uh, that particular state. And I, I do think that uh, uh, we need to expand the transmission system. We need to ex uh, expand the distribution system. We need to make the system much more resilient in the future uh, to, uh, uh, you know, uh, withstand the forces of mother nature. And, uh, and again, I, I just think this is a, an incredibly important part of the equation, but, you know, fortunately it has been recognized uh, by uh, policymakers on both sides of the aisle and by uh, both Republicans and Democrats. I uh, thank you for that question on interconnectivity. I just can't remember whether I attributed to to Ian Kingston. That was Ian Kingston's question. Thank you. Um, so there's no point in me asking people to give us their name if I don't mention their name, and I couldn't remember whether I did or not. Um, one for you, Pat. Um, a net question uh, specific to your role or specific to Ireland from uh, the Business Post, a current question from Sarah Taft McGuire. Pat, will electricity and gas prices continue to rise? What can the ESB do about this? Um, I, I think the short answer to that, uh, Sarah, is that who you said it was from? Sarah Alex, Taft McGuire from the Business Post. I think Sarah, the short, you, Sarah. the short answer is I don't know. And, and if I not been glib, if I, if I did know, I'd, I'd, uh, I'd be in a different job because I'd be trying to make some money out of the markets. But look, no, it, it is a really, really big issue because again, in the, in the transition, price is important. Um, so, so electricity prices, you know, wholesale electricity prices in Ireland have gone up. Uh, all, all suppliers have announced in Ireland recently electricity price increases. And that's off the back of gas prices driving up wholesale electricity prices. And why is gas driving? Because gas in Europe you know, gas, there's a shortage of gas in Europe. It's been, head, it's heading for uh, LNG gas is heading for the Far East and we're seeing gas prices going, we're seeing gas prices at the moment higher than we would see in, in at certain winter times. So the short answer is we don't know, but carbon price is going to go up. The European Union wants carbon prices to go up to drive behaviours. Um, and I, I, I suppose, you know, there is, a, there is a thesis in the longer term as we head for this transition that the unit price of electricity may will more than likely go up but that we'll be using less of it as we make our homes more efficient and we lead more efficient lives in energy terms but the overall price we pay for electricity should come down and um, but again that's a difficult message to be talking to customers about it's definitely a difficult political message okay interesting um sergio contreras um asked about what the panel's view is on the role that electricity companies and associations are playing in ensuring transition to electricity vehicles in the United States and in Europe. I go to you, Thomas. Well, we are very, very active in that area and, uh, and, and have been. And Sergio, I think uh, we can safely say we've uh, certainly turned the corner on that uh, issue as uh, um, you know, electric vehicles are expanding uh, rapidly in our country and, and around the world. Um, and we're, we're doing it with major customers like, uh, uh, like FedEx and Amazon, uh, where you see those companies uh, making tremendous commitments. Uh, we're doing it with the automobile manufacturers and working in tandem with them. Uh, we are spending more than uh, electric companies, more than $3 billion uh, on uh, charging infrastructure and advocating with our federal government to uh, to get involved in that very much as well. And we're seeing uh, the proposals and the energy infrastructure package that, that is being considered in our Congress, uh, that there is a great deal of support for electrification and transportation and, and, uh, and uh, infrastructure charging. And um, Pat, yep. Yeah, I, um, so we, 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 we have a, an EV infrastructure business um, that we, we were, we're one of the first in Europe to build an, uh, an end to end business across the, across the island of Ireland, uh, a charging infrastructure. Um, it's been upgraded in recent times. In fact, we launched a super hub earlier in the week in junction 14 on the M7. 
so so electric, electric vehicles now are becoming mainstream. We will see more and more people buying, we see more and more vehicles being available. The utilities have a role to play through their supply business in terms of, you know, 80% of electric vehicles will be charged in people's homes on night rate or cheaper electricity. So how utilities, how supply companies price electricity in the context of maybe smart metering and new products and services will drive the uptake of electric vehicles, as well as how more and more come on, on the market with, through the manufacturers and the, and the cost of them. I think in Ireland, it's probably, you know, it comes down to a choice about price now because you're getting batteries with 450 kilometers of range. So the range issue in Ireland is gone. Um, and so, so look, like Vigia, I think we've reached, we've, we've, we're pivoting that great word is used now where, you know, we're, it's, we've pivoted to a different era of electric vehicles. Terrific. Um, listen, we've covered a huge <clears throat> amount of ground and I'm so grateful to both of you uh, for your time. I'm going to just finish up on a qu one question to both of you. I might tag on a little extra one to Pat, um, uh, but I'll ask you both just, just as, as your closing thoughts in relation to how Europe and the US are collaborating or can collaborate more. Like what are the, what can we learn from each other and you've given a few examples actually already both of you have in terms of this crossover and you both know each other and you, you, you so you know from listening to each other over the years as to most what the what the various challenges are and you're able to compare and contrast but what do you think that we can learn from each other and are there trade and investment opportunities there that uh, can be pursued i'll go to you thomas first if i may well i think that was uh, the closing uh part of my opening statement was mm. talking about how international collaboration is so incredibly important. Uh, and again, uh, we commend and thank uh, Euro Electric and ESB for really uh, uh, working with us closely to support that. We've had at EEI this year, two transatlantic dialogues. Pat's been a, a part of them. Um, and the exchange of information on technologies, on pe public policies, uh, and markets, et cetera, is gonna be so important in the future as we do take on this historic challenge. I think that it's going to uh, uh, be very, very helpful that we're working with each other uh, on the international front and expanding our trade opportunities, et cetera. I mean, there's so many new technologies coming, uh, coming out uh, from companies that are on both sides of the Atlantic that are gonna benefit our customers. And that's the bottom line. So again, thank you. Thank you very much for IEA and ESB for this great uh, debate here and discussion. No, it's, been, it's, it's been great having you. I'm going to ask Pat just to address that US, Europe, but also just as you're doing it, if you have any reflections on your, you know, your 10 years as CEO, your 40 year career, you must have started, you must have been very young when you started if you've been there for 40 years. <laughs> um, like what reflections on what you've learned, where the industry is going, particularly over the next decade? Now, we don't have an awful lot of time as you'll appreciate. Okay. Anyway, so look, just, just thoughts, thoughts. Yeah, pick, you know, just a brain dump. So first yeah. of all, I think collaboration is essential and I think it's great, it is great to see the US back at the climate table really good I, and I I, I I think if Europe and the US walk lockstep in lo arm in arm out of Glasgow things now will really move on uh, you know collaboration util inter-utility now Mark is getting the way of us collaborating as well because we're competitors in, in as well mm. but through associations like your electric and EEI we can collaborate we're involved in the electric power research institute in the United States in fact they have anchored their European Centre here in Dublin, EP we have. Um, we do work with the universities here with UCC, uh, Mary, and with, 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 with UCD. I think that's really, really important. I think there's a unique opportunity here for Ireland as well because we have a big tech centre here in Ireland. So the US multinationals invest heavily in Ireland. So the role of the multinationals can play in the whole digital space, digitalizing the power sector, the whole question of corporate PPAs, they've got a requirement for green energy. We want to work with people who have a requirement for green energy. So coming together to collaborate in terms of long-term investments is, a, is another area in which all this collaboration can take place. In terms of my look back, I've had a fascinating time. As I said at the start, Alex, I'd love to be starting in this industry again because I think it is it's a fascinating industry. It is never dull and boring. There is so much for people to do. And we need people who can really reimagine what a power sector and the electricity mm. system is going to look like for the good of society. I, I think um, 
in terms of, you know, people today want to come and work for companies and in sectors that can make a difference. And I think this sector uh, does make a difference. And that's, that's our proposition, if you like, to the young, bright people out there who want to come and work. As I reflect back, particularly through the pandemic and on the last few years, mm. the work we've done in ESB, uh, and people, uh, anybody from Ireland on the call knows that we were founded to kind of, I suppose, to, to light a spark in Ireland to energize the company at the foundation, the country at the foundation of the state. An incredibly powerful vision for the company by the founding fathers of the company mm. who were the political system of its day. And as we reflect on the last decade and reflect on the next two or three decades, it's making that connection with where we've come from as an industry. And every, you know, the, particularly the, the utilities, the, the, what some people call the legacy utilities, that's what we're anchored in. And go back to what we were founded to do and take that forward uh, to do the right thing for society. That's, that's, I suppose, my reflection, Alex. You know, I think in ESB, we've, we, we know our place and we found our place yet again. Competition and regulation breaks the tradition utility structures apart. But there's something about an overlay on this, which is about the greater good of society, which is in our deep in our DNA. And I suppose that's my, that's my emotional reflection, Alex, as, yeah. I, as I kind of move on. No, Alex, I, I might say, everybody loves yeah. the Irish, but everybody yeah. in this industry is particularly love Pat O'Doherty. And really <laughs> oh, yes. Will you stop? <laughs> no, no, that's fair. I think, yeah. um, and, and thanks for, 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 for saying that, Tom, and thank you for being, you know, giving us your time uh, this afternoon uh, from the US. Um, I was going to say, well, this afternoon here, this morning over there. And like you really did address, you both did like such an amazingly wide range uh, of issues with your, you know, with your distinct expertise that you both have. And definitely the American perspective, you know, on the future of the electricity industry, it's always important here in Europe yes, for a whole lot of yeah. um, And especially at a time when, you know, this is the, 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 the shared long-term energy uh, target of net zero now that we have for 2050 and Glasgow coming and all of this new collaboration has been great. It's just been terrific uh, having you with us this afternoon, Thomas. Thank you so much. And Pat, I want to just add, just like to acknowledge, first of all, as your term comes to an end, the, the, the support you've given to the IIEA. I mean, I'm really privileged to be chairing these, to have been asked by IIEA and ESB to chair these sessions. Of the, the support that you've given uh, to the IIEA, IIEA over the last decade has been immense. And I think the two organizations have you know, collaborated very well on several occasions during that time with various conferences and, lectures, and lecture series in person and online in, in the last while. And it's just to give a platform for this leadership, this thought leadership uh, and this cross-sectoral debate on these, on these critical issues in, in energy policy. And I think it's been so valuable. And, you know, the success has been hugely enhanced by, you know, the constant support that we uh, in the IEA have from the top leadership at ESB all the time and consistent. It just keeps coming back. You know, it comes back. It's not a once off. It's not all oh, we'll throw, you know, we'll throw something into that and, and have our logo. It's not that, it's absolutely not that. It's the opposite from that. It's a genuine commitment at an intellectual level, at, at a public discourse level. And it's been, you know, it's been remarkable to see that. So thanks for your unwavering commitment to this uh, partnership. And I, you know, I want to just on my own behalf as well, just really wish you well. Um, you were saying there earlier on about that, that this is the phrase you said, it's a fascinating industry. And, you know, I think it is a fascinating industry, but if, if somebody has said to me in 20, even in early 2014, before I was appointed Minister for Energy, that this is a fascinating industry, I wouldn't necessarily argue with them because I wouldn't have known, but I, it's not two words I would have put together about, about, about an energy or electricity. No, you're right. But Within weeks of being minister, within weeks of actually, you know, reading in, understanding it with really good civil servants and with terrific people like Pat O'Doherty, you know, being educated and understanding it. I had no background, absolutely no background other than being an interested citizen of the country. And like, I really have no problem embracing that phrase, fascinating industry. I think it really is because at the heart of the transformation of the whole world, the economy and societies, as, as you both um, uh, refer to. And so I want to wish Pat well too. I remember a day, a number of many conversations that we had, and I wasn't minister for that long, but, you know, uh, really, really informative. But one a particular occasion when we were down in Arden of Crusha, uh, where you, you, you were there, so you arranged a briefing. We went, my, myself and my team went down to Arden of Crusha. Um, this is the, you know, the hydroelectric uh, um, generator. 
yeah. Um, which I'm sure you know, but when, when, when Pat was talking there about the foundation of the state, you know, this is, we're talking about the mid to late 1920s when this huge effort, like sort of it's state building, but it's also building of infrastructure. And it's sort of fascinating to read about that time. And uh, so it was arranged that we, I would go down as opposed to a new minister. And there was Pat, the, 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 the boss man was right there on the spot. And the enthusiasm that you had in explaining, showing me around your knowledge of it, you know, the beautiful engineering, in fact, that is, it w was associated with the design and the, the delivery of that, of that uh, facility in, in the 1920s, as you rightly say, was so impressive. So for all of those reasons and for many more that I'm sure many people on this call will be able to uh, attest, thank you for your contribution. And you said, you, you know, you're finishing up, you'd love to come back in. I don't think we've seen the last of you. Um, I, I certainly <laughs> hope we haven't. Anyway, I, so I, much I joined as passive observer, Alex. Yeah, yeah. Well, I'd say you'll 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 have a role to play, and I, I'm sure you will. Thank you once again, Pat. Thank you, Thomas. Thank, Thank you. you in particular to all of our participants, people who asked questions, and people who attended this afternoon. Uh, it's been a terrific occasion. Thank we'll you. See you again soon. All, all the best, Tom. All the best to you. God bless you, Pat. <laughs>